Today is Saturday, April 14th, 2012, and we are interviewing Lou Vargas in Springfield, Illinois. Lou, can, for the record, can you state your age and where you were born? And um, could you also state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be interviewing you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, my name is Lou Vargas. I'm from uh, Joel or Crest Hill, Illinois. Um, what was that? What was the branch of service in? I, I was in the Army, and I was in Vietnam, 67, 68. What was your rank? E4 was my highest rank. And where did you serve at? Uh, in Vietnam, I served uh, in the uh, Iron Triangle and then in the Mekong Delta area. At e, uh, uh, it was uh, south by, by Saigon in that, in that area, so in south of Saigon. What is the Iron Triangle? The Iron Triangle was an area where that, uh, it was a stronghold for the VC and that they try to maintain, and it was uh, between Dao Tien, Kuchi, and Saigon, and through there in uh, Tainan, and uh, they, it was a big stronghold for the VC back in those days. What was your job, job and your assignment? Well, originally I started out as a, a cannoneer. Uh, I was at, uh, I did my training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, for basic training, and uh, then I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for artillery. And uh, from there I, I was a, got trained on 105, 155s, and they sent me to Vietnam and I was put on a 175 8 inch battery, the biggest artillery guns they had, which was massive compared to what I was trained on, little toys compared to it. And uh, that's what I uh, uh, originally started out as just a cannoneer working on the can, uh, uh, working with the cannons as far as fire missions and stuff like that, handing the rounds and the powder to the gunners on the top of the guns. And uh, I start out with the 2nd 32nd Heavy Artillery out of Tainan. And uh, we were nothing but gypsies. We, we never, we hardly stayed at a base camp. We never really stayed at base camps. We were out, out in the bush all the time and wandering around from place to place. And we, um, we got to the point that uh, we'd never stay over seven days in a certain area because if you did, then the VC would know and they'd uh, try to attack us. So we were like gypsies, always on the run and always on the move. And uh, after I uh, left the 2nd 32nd, I was with a uh, short time with the 25th Infantry out of Kuchi, and I spent uh, approximately a month with them. And that was uh, a nightmare of its own again and opened up my eyes to a lot of different things being infantry. And I stayed with them for about 30 days. And after that, I went with the uh, uh, 7th to the 8th Heavy Artillery, and that's where I left Vietnam from. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes. Uh, I can't remember the exact time, but uh, I, I did get a, a unit bronze star. Uh, we got overrun. We almost lost everybody we had, and uh, we, we were on the verge of losing the guns. And the last thing we did was set charges to the guns to explode the guns in case we were to that point that we were going to totally uh, lose everything. But uh, fortunately, they came in and napalmed the heck out of uh, our area, which we called for a strike right on us. And uh, that was the only thing that saved us. And because of. Uh, saving the guns and all we, the ones of us that were left got unit bronze star. What was the food like? <laughs> it 
tin cans. Most of my time over there was tin cans. You know, uh, a lot of times I wish I'd been in the Air Force. <laughs> Uh, when when I went to R and R in October of '67, I had to stay at an Air Force base down in Tonsonute, and I couldn't believe that these guys were actually getting fresh food and vegetables and fruit. My God, it was unbelievable seeing their mess hall compared to sitting on the ground opening up a tin can. So it was mainly tin cans that I lived out of. Do you like food in tin cans now? Well, there's a lot of good things in tin cans nowadays. Did you have plenty of supplies? Uh, no. In fact, uh, one of the worst things we didn't have was air protection. And I was on the one, 175 8 inch guns where you're firing 90 pounds of powder. You could fire 30, 60, or 90 pounds. They were in 30 pound bags. And uh, we had no air protection. And uh, as far as supplies, uh, very, very minimal supplies. We, uh, even for the guns. Now, when I got injured, I was put into uh, the maintenance uh, with, with the guns and all that. And uh, we virtually had to repair them with uh, piece, old inner tubes, uh, hoses that were bad. We'd had to replace wood inner tubes, a wire, and stuff like this because we couldn't get the stuff. It was very, very poorly supplied. And water was one of the worst things. You, you, you didn't get much water. And uh, we could get beer easier we could water. And when I drove a truck over there, I always kept two cases of beer, they were in cans, underneath the front seat of my truck. And all the other guys knew I had it all the time, so I. I didn't care if anybody grabbed it, but that was the only, and you wonder why so many alcoholics came out of Vietnam, but uh, that is the truth. Tell us about staying in touch with your family. Uh, it's not like now where they got cell phones and everything else. Uh, letters was the only communications, and uh, uh, that was basically it, and uh, all I did was write my I have two sisters and two brothers, and one of my sisters mainly used to write me just about every day, and I, I still commend her very highly for that because it, it just to receive a letter over there, I mean it was like Christmas Day every day to be able to get a letter. I mean it was fantastic. Was there a big lag time in receiving the mail? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, and as my mom found out, uh, she. Uh, she would send me these care packages with chips and stuff like that, but uh, after she sent me a Hershey bar and one of them, I told don't do that again, because <laughs> with the extreme heat, that, did, that didn't make it. Did you do or have something special for good luck? Uh, not till the very end. Near the end, uh, I left, uh, while well, I left Vietnam, uh, January 18, 68, but the Christmas of 67, my ma sent me a stuffed dog, a little tiny stuffed dog, and uh, I named him Fred. And in fact, uh, after I got home, one of the black eyes of him that he had fell out, and we said he got shot out in the war. <laughs> but Fred has been with me ever since, and I still keep him to today. Fred has been with me. How did you entertain yourself? <laughs> Didn't have time for entertaining. Uh, with artillery, we were constantly being mortared because it's not like with infantry where you can move around and get away from things. And with artillery, you're there and you're set. And uh, mortaring was constant every day. I mean, you, at, at night, that is. And uh, you just got used of it. And uh, as far as entertainment, uh, there was really no, during the day, now we had radios, and uh, we played the radios when we were working on the guns, doing repairs and stuff like that, but at night, it's, it's total silence. So there was no entertainment. Did you ever have any entertainment, uh, entertainers come and see you? You will not believe this. I only seen one my whole time there. 
Nancy Sinatra and uh, in Tainan we had an area that was called the Tainan Rice Bowl and uh, Nancy Sinatra did show up there and this is far far away from Saigon or anywhere like where Bob Hope he would never come back to these areas but again it, it was during the day and uh, at that time things were very uh, or only when things seemed very secure would they do this and uh, if it was not secure they wouldn't even allow her to come in but they did allow Nancy Sinatra and I did see her and I thought that was that was very you know it was the only thing the whole time I was there that I ever did see Nancy Sinatra. Did she sing for you? Yes yeah, she did. She did sing and she was fantastic and uh, you don't care what she sang or how she sang it, it was good. <laughs> and it was good just to see somebody like that. Do you remember what she sang? These boots are made for walking. <laughs> and at that time, uh, the girlfriend that I had when I went to Vietnam, uh, the mamas and the papas came up with a song, uh, Words of Love, and she said that was our song and we were going to prove in a, one verse in their old time phrases, uh, uh, um, and long engages don't get you where you want to go and she said we're going to prove them wrong two months after I was there she quit writing me <laughs> <laughs> did you get any leaves when you were over there uh, the only thing that I got was a regular R&R &R in October of 67 that's the only time that I ever had any time away from Vietnam and where did you go? Bangkok, Thailand and I stayed on a five-day drunk so and enjoyed every minute of it. Do you remember any of it? Not too much, not too much, but I, when I got back to Tons New Air Force Base after r and &R, I met Hank Williams Jr. in Tons Newt, and I did drink with him. And I got to meet him in Colorado in uh, Manitoulin Springs at the Sundown Lounge. I got to meet him a year later. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual event besides Nancy Sinatra and <laughs> Hank Williams Jr.? No, there, you, you didn't, how do you say, you, you, we weren't conditioned for uh, humorous stuff and we didn't, uh, we didn't play the type of games. We strictly uh, watch, watching ourselves, and uh, even during the day you're watching for snipers and uh, especially with artillery when we're out there because uh, we're, we're, we're fair game. And uh, if, uh, so, no, there were... What did you think of your officers and fellow soldiers? <laughs> Officers were definitely from West Point, and uh, they proved it. And uh, we used to make bets when new ones would come in how long they'd last. And uh, the shortest time we had was one got flown in at five o'clock, and he was gone by two o'clock in the morning. So. Why was that? He got blown up. He. Uh, he didn't want to listen to us. When we were in a mortar attack, you, you, stay, you stay covered wherever you're at and uh, whatever cover you could get and you stay there. And he wanted us to go man to guns. And we told him he was out of his mind. And he told us that he was going to get us all court-martialed for not obeying his orders. We said, we're not going out until the firing stops, until the mortaring stopped. And he jumped up. And that was the last we seen of him. Did you keep a personal diary? No. No, I didn't. Because every day was different, every day. And over there, uh, it was so humid. If you try to, it, other than writing a letter to a family and it's, uh, putting it in an envelope, other than that, uh, things didn't last. So uh, the humidity in that would get to it. So. No, I never kept anything at that time. Uh, 
just more or less let it go day by day. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yes. Fort Carson, Colorado, June 13, 1966. I uh, I asked the first sergeant and the man that was in charge of the quarters to come into the lieutenant's office with me, and they did. And uh, I looked at the lieutenant, saluted him, and told him, "Sir, due respect of your rank, you are no good, so and so, and if you got." Uh, any uh, mm -hmm, that you would uh, meet me in Colorado Springs at the airport and I will be willing to show you what I think of you and uh, he never did show but and then I said sir and saluted him again and that is protocol and that was my last few minutes in the army the cab was already waiting for me so, What did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? <coughs> when I came home from the Army, I stayed on a month drunk. Solid full month. Till I realized I was out of money, then I had to go to work. Because <laughs> then I didn't, couldn't get no more Beer, couldn't do no more. So I decided, well, then I went to work. Did you go back to school and use the GI Bill? Uh, I did go back to junior college, but it wasn't until uh, later, way later. It was a couple years later, well, quite a few years later, that I went back to junior college. Now, I quit school in 1963, and going into my junior year, and I think I was prime candidate for draft. But uh, when I went back to junior college uh, in uh, 73, um, I ended up carrying an A and B average and got my GED and uh, pushed it hard then. What did you uh, do? What kind of work did you do? Uh, First started out as an auto mechanic, then I went into industrial maintenance, and because uh, auto mechanic was too carrying around stuff, beating my brains in, but then industrial maintenance a lot more, or a lot not easier, but uh, it's not on the same basis like that. So I stayed with industrial maintenance. That's why I stayed with my whole life. I retired out of ComEd in uh, 2000, uh, 2002, April 10th. Last year was 10 years I've been out. Did you, um, do you continue any relationships from the service? Uh, only one. There was a, a man that uh, was with me in the 7th to the 8th Heavy Artillery and he was he had gone to be a warrant officer and he was going to Indianapolis uh, for uh, training in Indianapolis and he was out of Pennsylvania and uh, he came up to our, on the weekend to my house to see me and uh, it was a fantastic thing I was glad to see this guy because I hadn't seen him and he basically is the only person I've seen since I've been back from Vietnam that I was ever with Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or military in general? Well, I didn't, I, I wouldn't uh, have made a service career after Vietnam. Things were not pleasant, things were not nice, they were not good, and uh, I just wanted out. They were offering some very good bonuses at that time, and uh, they were offering uh, you go anywhere for one year, or anywhere in the world, but 
with my MOSs, I know where I was going to go back after, for the last two. And uh, no, I didn't. Never seen anything as far as a military career. And uh, the spit shine boots and the uh, saluting and no, nah, that wasn't that wasn't what I wanted. How has your service and experience affected your life? It showed it it has showed me that I can do things I didn't think I could do. And it's uh, also proven to me that I have the abilities to do these things. When, I, when I've thought that uh, I'm just nothing or just uh, away from everything, I've, I've proven that I've had the abilities to show. And uh, how do they say in one way, it's like showing off in a way, but to me it's an inner feeling of this, and I like doing it to prove that I have the abilities to do it now and to continue on. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, since uh, now in uh, 2002, I was interviewed by Cheryl Reed, uh, from uh, the Sun Times, and she she wrote a beautiful article about me. And uh, shortly after, I did get my percentage with the DAV, or with the uh, for disability, and did get my hundred percent. And uh, since then, it's more or less been a crusade. That it's. Like they say, the Army, we don't leave anybody behind. Now, this is what I'm going after. And I push to help other veterans. And um, in 2000, uh, let's see, this is 12. In 2011, I was awarded, uh, I, I belong to the VAC in uh, uh, Will County. And I was awarded uh, uh, the chairman of board for the VAC in January, and uh, I thought this was a very, very high honor to receive. And it, it touched me very much that I would be considered for this award. But then uh, after, after the award, uh, the Patch, a newspaper in uh, New Lenox, an online paper, wrote a great big article about me again, and this reopened a lot of things. And in July of last year, I was chosen Veteran of the Month for the state of Illinois. And to me, this is one of the highest accomplishments I could have ever gotten. And uh, I, I just keep pushing and to keep helping. I've been a commander of the Disabled American Veterans School starting my seventh year. And I, I feel very honored to be commander of the DAV. I've been commander of a VFW, New Lenox, 9545, for uh, the last three years. So I'm a dual commander. I'm also uh, district commander, uh, northern district commander for the disabled American veterans, and I'm senior vice commander of district for the VFW. Uh, and uh, how, how can I say there's everything I've strived for, I've been able to succeed in now. And it, it's been nothing but I, I just get the pride. I don't, I don't need no money for what I do. It's the pride that I feel inside. This is m worth more than anything. I've helped many veterans get their 100%. And everyone asks me, how much money can I, I says, I don't need money. I don't want it. Two things I demand, a handshake and a hug. I demand that. And once I get that, that, that opens my chest goes out 10 feet because I know what I've done and how proud I feel of being able to do it. And every time, every time I it just, it's the same way every time when this happens. Any veteran I could help, I feel the same way over and over again. It's just the pure pride. Lou, I want to thank you for being here for the time you served for our country 
It's an honor sitting here today with you. Thank you. Thank you.